talking today about uh, about CloudStack, and uh, um, so uh, Apache CloudStack is uh, is a project that's pretty fresh in the incubator, and just to um, this uh, presentation is available under either the Apache license or, or Creative Commons, um, so you're free to take it and do whatever you wish. But to give you a quick timeline uh, on the history of CloudStack, uh, there was a company, a startup that was formed in 2008 called VMOps that began writing what we know today as CloudStack. Um, and uh, in 2009, they started actually doing deployments and, and very quickly realized that, that anything related to cloud computing um, was going to have to be focused on uh, open source. Uh, and so in early 2010, uh, they released CloudStack as an open source project, and it was initially licensed under the GPL version 3. Um, a little over a year later, uh, they were acquired by Citrix. Uh, and shortly after we were acquired by Citrix, we made everything. So previously, we had withheld some features um, from, uh, from the open source release. Uh, shortly after uh, moving to Citrix, uh, Citrix allowed us to open source all of CloudStack, um, and uh, and we ended up with uh, uh, shortly thereafter coming out with the first major uh, release since uh, since we've been acquired, um, and a couple months after that, uh, we decided to uh, see conclusion into the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, into their incubator project. Uh, we did that in April of 2012. Uh, so we've been there um, literally almost uh, three months now uh, and making making quite good progress, I, from my opinion, uh, as a project uh, within the Apache Amphitheater. So um, what is CloudStack? Uh, CloudStack is an open source infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, and and it supports multiple hypervisors, including multiple hypervisors within the same cloud. Uh, some really complex networking, uh, firewall, load balancer, VPN services that you can provision. Uh, being able to provide high availability, uh, we'll talk about high availability in a bit, uh, but high availability services uh, to your hypervisor regardless of the platform you're using. Uh, and to do all of that in a multi-tenant environment so that we're keeping things isolated. Your users don't know what your other users are doing. And that was a nice marketing blurb, right? So the real question is, what does it really do? And, and the important things that CloudStack does is that it provides separation for all of the people who are, uh, who are in your cloud, uh, who are making use of your resources. And it allows you to provide them access to resources uh, and to abstract that away and to allow them to allocate those resources in a manner that you determine. So, you know, if you want to consume every last uh, possible resource from, uh, from a given set of machines or a given network, you can set it up to do that. You can set it up to distribute it out, uh, you know, spread things out as much as possible. Um, really, though, and cloud computing, one of the key tenets of cloud computing is that you're uh, providing an abstraction layer that allows you to provide uh, a level of control to your users that, uh, that previously you would never have been comfortable doing. So uh, you may not allow them to log into a load balancer, but you will uh, allow them to effectively configure the load balancer via CloudStack because they don't have access directly to the load balancer. The CloudStack can give them the ability to A, do it themselves and not have to get uh, the administrator involved and, um, and to do so in, in a secure and safe manner. Um, CloudStack's also incredibly scalable. Um, uh, literally some of the largest deployments are in the tens of thousands of physical hosts. Um, CloudStack can also manage high availability um, and uh, effectively, and we'll, we'll talk about high availability in a bit, but effectively ensuring that a VM that you, uh, that you consider valuable continues to stay up even if the hosts or the VM go down. Um, and of course, you know, you're providing this incredible amount of power to, to the end users who are provisioning resources, and so you need to have uh, two abilities uh, to, to kind of rein things in. The first is 
uh, you've got to be able to place limits uh, because when people think they have uh, an unlimited uh, an unlimited set of resources, they will consume an unlimited set of resources. Uh, and so the two the two ways that you do that is we provide you a, a means of measuring usage, and uh, so you can. Uh, we'll talk a little more in depth about how much uh, what you can measure that people are actually using. Uh, but we also allow you to place limits, so you can say in number of VMs or in number of, of disk volumes, um, in number of public IP addresses, etc. Um, so you can place resource limits um, and make those uh, inheritable, uh, and we'll see how we divide up uh, users and accounts and things like that in a bit. So. We have multiple hypervisor support. Um, today we have uh, KDM Zen Server Zen Cloud Platform. Uh, we support both 1.1 and 1.5. Um, we support VMware and both uh, essentially vSphere, uh, both 4.1 and 5.0, uh, although we require you to have vCenter to do that. Uh, and we also support Oracle VM. Uh, I've got bare metal listed down there as a uh, as a hypervisor, and it's not really a hypervisor, but um, we often make the assumption when you're dealing with cloud computing that you'll be dealing with um, that you'll be dealing with virtual machines, and I think that's a flawed assumption. Um, some of the largest uh, clouds in the world, uh, places like Google and and uh, and Facebook, do truly have a uh, a cloud an internal cloud computing environment. Uh, they are consuming the entire machine. And they are not—they're uh, not wasting any resources on the abstraction layer because they can consume all of the resources for many machines uh, without needing to, to distribute uh, distribute workloads across a single machine. Um, and so, CloudStack provides uh, support for managing bare metal. Um, specifically, will manage any uh, x86 hardware that will pixie boot and has IPMI uh, for its uh, out-of-band management. And uh, uh, you know there are obviously some limits. You can't do some of the the intense networking things that you would otherwise do, but you can have um, you can have uh, some of the uh, some of the things like deploying a, a an operating system. Uh, although you can't do things like uh, security groups or or uh, VLAN allocation um, that uh, that you can do with some of the hypervisors. So we talked about multi-tenant separation, um, and largely the abstraction is really um, built around the end user's point of view. We assume the system administrator of the cloud can log into um, can log into all of their storage resources. They can get root on their hypervisors or on the bare metal. Um, they can get into their load balancer and configure it. So the the separation and abstraction is is largely end user focused, and and the idea is that an end user should not need to know uh, about the hypervisor or even that there is a hypervisor, uh, and they don't need to know about the underlying storage. Uh, they don't necessarily need to know about the networking, uh, although you know maybe they want to to handle firewall rules or or uh, they want to uh, create some some networking schemes that are unusual. They certainly have that option, but it's not uh, it's not something that is uh, uh, that they have to know about. Uh, CloudStack will will keep that uh, abstracted away from them, so that they can worry about getting a machine on, getting the operating system on the machine, uh, and actually doing something with it, using it, without having to know about things like iSCSI or multipathing or um, fiber channel over Ethernet, etc. So when we talk about multi-tenant separation, there's also this networking separation because virtually everything that you want to do uh, is network connected, and if you don't isolate the networking, uh, you uh, you haven't really isolated anything at all. So uh, CloudStack has a number of different network modes. Uh, those are basically carved up into uh, two or three uh, major types. Uh, the first type is whether or not you are controlling physical hardware because CloudStack can interact with uh, a number of physical uh, pieces of hardware, whether that's a firewall uh, or router, 
like a Juniper SRX or a load balancer like an F5, a uh, big IP load balancer, um, or it can do all of that in software. Uh, so the hardware software is one division. There's also the type of separation. Um, so we have the more traditional uh, VLAN uh, separation where essentially every account gets a dedicated uh, VLAN, at least one dedicated VLAN uh, that is, that's uh, completely isolated to them. Um, and that's, that's great for smaller cloud implementations and it also keeps things somewhat familiar. Um, it's not very scalable. Uh, and so typically when you're concerned about scale issues, um, people are moving to using layer three isolation. Uh, we'll talk a little more in depth about uh, security groups uh, in a bit, but um, effectively that allows you to, to skip some of the, the VLAN limitations. And of course, as I talked about, you have that option to use dedicated hardware. So I talked about, um, I talked about the these networking models being broken down by, by the method of isolation and whether it's physical hardware or virtual. Uh, so CloudStack will provide some virtual network resources because a virtualized appliance is effectively the lowest common denominator. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've seen uh, as an effect of cloud computing is that uh, there is a push to everything commodity. Uh, and so that uh, You'll see that when you see some of the people talking about distributed storage later, uh, and uh, and certainly cloud computing. You know, we're, we've gotten away from the uh, we've gotten away from um, you know, having that one massive um, uh, one massive mainframe that everyone uh, is time sharing on. Uh, while those are still certainly viable, uh, that is not what cloud computing is necessarily about. So. These are some of the, um, the services that are offered today uh, by CloudStack. So if you did decide to, uh, to run some of the virtualized uh, appliances, we will manage DHCP, we will manage allocating VLANs. You essentially say this block of VLANs is available and CloudStack will take care of allocating them and keeping them, uh, keeping them reserved for specific accounts. Uh, it can handle firewall uh, as well as NAT and port forwarding services. Uh, naturally, it'll do routing um, and, uh, and also will do some VPN and load balancing offerings as well. So we talked about physical hardware. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is the, the list, I believe, of currently supported physical hardware. Um, there's also uh, support for uh, Cisco Nexus 1000. Uh, devices and uh, and of course uh, doing OpenFlow and OpenV switch, uh, which uh, which is pushing back out towards um, push, pushing back out towards uh, virtualized um, doing virtualized networking. But uh, all of these are certainly options. Um, one of the interesting things that we found is that people uh, typically want to mix and match. So we had the list of all of the services that CloudStack offers, and you can pick a, uh, a subset of those to offer to end users. You can also uh, pick some of these uh, physical hardware devices and offer that as well. So you can have, uh, you know, offer both a, an F5 load balancer and a um, and the virtualized load balancer, and offer that as uh, competing services to the same customer, and the customer can decide uh, essentially, you know whether that's an internal customer or not, um, uh, that person can decide which one they actually want to consume and assuming uh, the assumption is that you would have different uh, prices or chargeback rates uh, for varying levels of, of these services. So I said we would talk about security groups and uh, so let's talk really quick about them. Uh, and we'll first talk about some of the problems. So uh, people are, are pretty comfortable with VLANs now, and VLANs do a good job of isolation. Uh, they don't do a great job of scaling. Uh, the, the actual standard has the 4,096 VLAN limit, so you can exceed 4K uh, VLANs. Um, the bigger problem, though, is that hardware that can actually keep up with 4,096 VLANs on a single network 
is incredibly expensive. Um, and, and even if it wasn't, um, when people are building out what is supposed to be a scalable system, they don't like having a standard or anyone else telling them that there are some arbitrary limits that are in place, uh, especially if they've spent uh, six or seven figures on routing and, and switching hardware to be able to handle it. Um, so really Amazon was, uh, um, I think they did a lot of forward thinking when they deployed security groups for their network model. And, um, and so this is effectively moving up. Uh, VLANs are layer two isolation. This is moving up one layer and this is layer three isolation. Uh, so let's talk real quickly about some of the elements. Uh, essentially it's assuming that, that the layer two network that you're plugging into uh, you have some degree of trust in um, and that essentially you're only going to have hypervisors connected uh, to that network um, and essentially instead of having you would typically have a routing device or you would have a um, firewall device and that would become the choke point there would be a single point where traffic would flow in and out of that network rather than having a single or, or even a clustered set of those, um, this is moving that, um, that isolation back uh, and bringing that back to the, um, bringing that back down to the, uh, to the hypervisor and the hypervisor will have a bridge device and that bridge device um, will, uh, will handle all the filtering and firewalling. It's just doing it at one, one layer higher at layer three. Um, the other thing is, is that this allows you to deny everything by default and require end users to open things up manually. Um, so you'll get to see my beautiful artwork. This is about the limit of, uh, of what I can do as far as aesthetic quality. Um, but, uh, so you have in this particular picture of three VMs, you've got this flat line down below that, uh, that is your network and um, and all of that traffic flows in and the uh, the big square blue looking device that's caved in up top uh, that is the bridge device on the hypervisor and so any traffic coming into the the hypervisor or to the VMs or for the VMs communicating amongst themselves or back out will have to pass through uh, that bridge device and so that bridge device makes a uh, a good place for um, for controlling network access. It also makes this far more scalable because instead of having a single one and having tens of thousands of physical hosts uh, standing behind it, now you have tens of thousands of firewalls and you merely have to orchestrate their configuration. And so in, a, in an environment with multiple hypervisors, uh, with multiple VMs, if the VMs wish to talk to each other, um, they would have to pass through two different bridges uh, and so you have both egress and ingress filtering there. Um, one, other, one other note I will say that security groups are unique to um, an account uh, so you cannot share an, a security group with someone outside your account uh, which means that all of your machines truly are your machines unless you open them up uh, to a given network. Uh, you can't uh, you can't share a security group, although you can certainly open up uh, access to the world or to a subset of, of addresses. So uh, I said we talked about high availability. Uh, this is one of the few marketing slides that made it into the presentation. Um, high availability is not what people traditionally think about when they're thinking about high availability. Uh, it's not in vir any virtualization. Uh, so typically if you have um, if you have experience with real high availability, uh, you're thinking of things like Zookeeper or CoreSync, and you're thinking about uh, things like Linux HA, which try to ensure that there is literally zero or very little downtime. Uh, this, uh, in virtualization, high availability uh, is really, uh, really fast mean time for recovery. Um, but uh, apparently HA is both cheaper and looks better in marketing slicks, so um, everybody in the virtualization field uh, calls RF MTTR uh, HA. Um, so CloudStack isn't a magical solution for high availability. 
But if you turn on the magic high availability button uh, via the API or via the uh, web interface, CloudStack will watch your uh, HA enabled VMs to ensure that they stay up. Um, and uh, if the hypervisor goes up, uh, goes offline, or the VM goes offline, CloudStack will restart the VM, um, move it to a different piece of hardware if necessary. Um, and, uh, and so you can at least reduce the time that you're down. Uh, again, this is not a panacea. If you need real high availability, there are other options. Um, even CloudStack recognizes this, and you'll see, um, you'll notice that we consider uh, the length of time, and typically it takes at least a minute uh, for us to fence off a, uh, um, a VM to ensure that it's really down and it's not a case of split brain. Um, so while we're fencing that, that's a tremendous amount of downtime, and, and in practice, that ranges anywhere from 60 seconds to five minutes. Um, so for things that have to be completely up, like um, if you're using uh, VLANs for isolation, we have a routing service uh, that we'll provide. Uh, we'll do that with, um, with a redundant router and use uh, VRRP to provide redundancy and high availability uh, because effectively we've determined that taking down an entire network of virtual machines is even if it's only for 60 seconds, is far too long. Um, so uh, CloudStack has a, uh, uses VRRP to actually provide high availability services uh, for its routing and, uh, and other network services. Um, and uh, so again, CloudStack's VM high availability is, is not a uh, panacea for HA, uh, but it can be a useful tool. So we talked. Um, really briefly about being able to deterministically allocate resources even though you're not the one who's acquiring the resources. And so, you know, how you, uh, how you align which VMs on which physical hosts or, or how you uh, handle IP addresses and things of that nature, CloudStack has a number of allocation algorithms that say uh, this is how you will deploy things. So I want to fill um, I want to fill all the machines up first, or I don't care, and just, just put it on the first machine you come to, or perhaps you're using a, a random allocation. Um, if, you get, uh, if you get moving into that, and uh, you, can, you can choose any of those allocation options for your cloud, uh, or you can, of course, write your own. Uh, they are comparatively trivial to, to write. There's actually a document on, on writing that uh, allocator uh, algorithm out there. Um, but sometimes you know, your needs may not be such that, uh, that you want to apply it to your entire cloud um, and you may want to, uh, you may have some very simple things. So we have some other ways for determining how, um, how resources are acquired. We have this concept of tags which allows you to um, essentially label a resource uh, and so you know, supposing you have a very expensive set of resources that are really fast CPUs with fast interconnects to, um, to SSD storage and a 10 gigabit network, uh, you could label that as expensive. And so only when an expensive service offering uh, was acquired would it try to go out and find that specific, uh, uh, that specific set of resources. And uh, that gives you a kind of a quick and dirty way to, to set up different service offerings, uh, different levels of service offerings, and not make it a, a free-for-all among all of your resources. Um, we also have this ability to do uh, OS preference, and this was largely driven by licensing concerns. Uh, so you can get licensing for operating systems and products that allow you to run an unlimited number of copies as long as it stays on the same set of physical sockets. Um, so you could uh, you could set up a, uh, a set of hosts that were dedicated to Windows or dedicated to an Oracle database and provision a number of copies on that and have it so that only, uh, as long as there were resources available, those resources would only deploy uh, to, uh, to items with that preference. Uh, that would minimize, uh, tend to minimize your licensing costs. So we talked about being able to track uh, usage and talking about how uh, you know this is one of the constraints because typically you would either charge back or 
or actually bill people for their usage. Uh, so CloudStack does not do billing um, because billing takes a lot of forms. For some people, that's uh, interacting with SAP. Uh, for other people, it's uh, actually charging a credit card. Um, so CloudStack doesn't really do billing, but it does give you the numbers to bill with. So we track usage statistics uh, showing things like the uh, count of virtual machines, um, how much CPU usage, and, and how many disks were allocated and actually used, uh, network usage, and tracking that over time. So you can, you can say you had n number of uh, CPU uh, time actually being consumed. Um, and of course there's lots of integration and, and how-tos about uh, using this. Uh, there are a number of folks like Amista who have a beautiful uh, billing portal um, uh, and everything else from Hostbill and Ubersmith and Citrix even has a, uh, a billing platform called Cloud Portal. Um, although at the simplest level uh, the easiest way to do that is, uh, is to use Excel and uh, uh, if you go out and search for Excel Cloud Stack usage, you can uh, you can find a blog article someone wrote on how they essentially dump all of that to Excel. And uh, for their private cloud, that is that is sophisticated enough, and they could then uh, talk to managers for people who are consuming excess resources. So um, I also have a beautiful picture of a cloud, and uh, just to give you a, a high level architectural overview of kind of the fluffiness that is cloud stack. Um, we have a multiple types of storage. Uh, the first is secondary storage. And we use that for storing templates, which are uh, essentially how we deploy a, uh, a virtual disk for a running VM, and also for snapshots. Um, and historically, we have always used NFS, um, but we recently added uh, the option to do object storage. So technically, you could do uh, you could do Swift, uh, but a number of people like Coringo and GlusterFS also implement the Swift API, and so those others should work as well. Um, one of the things that, that people often don't understand is that when you're uh, when you're dealing with um, a large geographically distributed uh, cloud, that typically running all of this on a single box in one data center isn't going to work. And so we effectively have this concept of system VMs, and, and they provide a number of services, but one of them is um, secondary storage. Um, and effectively, that takes care of offloading um, templates and snapshots uh, to and from primary storage, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, getting rid of old snapshots after you've, they've reached your uh, aging limits. And, uh, and it, these are distributed and scale up on demand. So if you don't have enough capacity uh, to handle it with a single secondary storage VM, another one will spin up. And these are availability zone specific. So uh, typically an availability zone is going to be a data center. Um, and uh, so you would have at least one. And if you needed additional to handle the, the uh, level of, of work, uh, they would scale up to deal with that. So we talked real briefly about primary storage. And uh, primary storage, we essentially are are, um, this is where the virtual machines are running. Um, in the, if you're just using the user interface, we support NFS, iSCSI, and clustered LVM. Um, but we can also make use of local storage and also anything that you can get the hypervisor to connect to. So if you, uh, if you want to do fiber channel over Ethernet or ATA over Ethernet, for that matter, you can uh, you can set up a storage resource in Zen Server or mount it uh, and provide us the mount point in KVM um, or have a, uh, have a dedicated VMFS set up in VMware. Um, but basically anything that all of the hypervisors in the cluster can mount and write to will work as a storage repository uh, for your hypervisor. Um, and shared mount points, uh, regardless of what type of uh, storage they're using, are useful if you need uh, high availability or you need to migrate workloads off of storage. Um, a lot of people who have taken on this uh, being able to scale horizontally out and, and keeping everything stateless, um, they do not use shared storage at all. Instead, they use um, 
they use only the local disks on the machine, uh, which means there's no high availability and no live migration. But they've solved that problem higher up the stack, and so they're not worried about that at all. Um, so talking about resource divisions, uh, we have zones, pods, and clusters within CloudStack. Uh, we rarely consider an individual host uh, within CloudStack. Uh, typically, we're dealing with one of these levels of, of grouping. So a zone uh, is typically used to designate a specific geographic location. Uh, typically, this is a single data center. Uh, and this shares secondary storage resources, and it also shares a single network model. So if you have a need to have multiple network models, you can have multiple zones and have a different network model in each. And uh, some people are mixing, uh, mixing zones within a data center simply to give themselves networking flexibility. Um, and again, these are otherwise arbitrary other than, than what people uh, are typically doing. But a pod is, in general practice, a, uh, a rack of machines or a row of racks. And all of, the, uh, all of the machines in a pod will share a guest network. So when virtual machines get deployed uh, within a pod, they will all share a single guest network, uh, even if that guest network might be segmented off because of VLANs. Um, but the underlying... Uh, network is assumed to be shared. And then we have a cluster, and this is typically the, the smallest level that we deal with. Um, and this is, uh, you know, generally 8 to 15 machines are in a cluster. And there's uh, some requirement that things be the same here. So we require the same hypervisor uh, and the same version of the hypervisor, the same CPUs, and the same networking across all the machines in a cluster because virtual machines may migrate uh, because of maintenance outages or because of you know, just rebalancing the load within that. Um, and so uh, all of those machines essentially have to be the same. Um, and uh, all of those machines will also share, if you're using shared storage and not local storage, uh, all of those machines will share uh, primary storage. Uh, so they'll share the same uh, storage repository. So networking is probably the most complicated uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of any cloud deployment. Um, and CloudStack is no exception there. Um, so we've got management networks, private networks, public networks, guest networks, link local networks. Uh, potentially a couple of other networks, depending upon your, your type of network deployment. Uh, and to complicate matters, we, uh, several of these may be the same. So if you're, doing, uh, if you're using security groups, uh, you may well have your guest network and your public network be the same thing. Uh, so there are plenty of networks, uh, and we use that for isolation of, of control planes or isolation of, of traffic. So uh, you know, if you're running a highly segmented network using lots of VLANs, you certainly wouldn't want your public network and your guest network and your management network to share the same to share the same network. Although, if you're using security groups and using that to provide your isolation, that might be okay. So, all of this is controlled by a management server, um, and the management server handles all of these allocation decisions. Uh, it handles um, handles allowing the user to interact, and that becomes the the uh, kind of the focal point of of interaction. Um, but uh, you know, I really give some credit to the people who were originally designing this. Um, all of the management server pieces are stateless. Um, state is actually stored in a MySQL database, um, and so you can have. You know, 15 different management servers still divide up the load amongst themselves and, uh, and are able to, to be used. And if one of them goes away, it's okay uh, because state's not tracked with it. Uh, when, uh, when that transaction times out, the, another management server will pick up the transaction and move it forward. Um, another thing, the UI I think is beautiful. Uh, but uh, they also made some really good design decisions uh, in telling people that um, 
essentially there were not going to be any magic uh, with the UI. All the UI functionality is an API call. So anything you can do in the API, you can also do in an automated fashion just by making an API call. So I talked about API. Um, uh, CloudStack actually supports two. Um, the first is uh, CloudStack's native API. And CloudStack provides a RESTful API interface. Um, and this says unauthenticated on port 8096. Sadly, that's outdated, and I need to update this slide. Um, we used to provide unauthenticated API uh, interaction on port 8096, but we've now uh, turned that off by default. You can still turn that back on. Uh, but essentially, that allows you to, if you were on the machine that the management server was on, you could execute, um, you could execute uh, API without having to, um, without having to sign or authenticate. So, on the same port, typically as the uh, as the interface, uh, the web interface itself, we're also listening um, for uh, for API calls and will provide responses in XML or JSON. And I've got a, a, a quick demo uh, API call here. Um, so the, the red portion of that API call is just the URL, and uh, the green section is the API key, or effectively my user ID. Uh, and then we have in blue the, the actual command that's being called. Uh, in this case, it's deploy virtual machine in the yellow or orange color. Uh, we have all of the arguments against that. So we're telling it um, the service offering, which tells it how big of a virtual machine to provision, uh, the template ID, which tells it the disk image that it's going to get, and the zone ID is telling it which availability zone to position into. Um, and finally, we've got a, a hash signature that uses a secret key uh, against all of the rest of those uh, arguments. And so uh, it'll pull against that. CloudStack also has uh, an EC2 um, interface. Um, uh, it's obviously optional to turn on, but you can essentially um, point your tools like Photo or um, uh, Elastic Fox uh, to your CloudStack implementation and manage them as if they were EC2. Um, so I've got a note here to go play with the, the API, so I'll show you the a real brief section. This is slide, sadly a uh, um, I think a slightly dated copy of the UI, but this is the CloudStack user interface, uh, and you can see uh, you can see uh, resources that are seen at a uh, at a uh, cloud view, and uh, this is somewhat useful, but I would encourage you not to to make this a crutch because it doesn't get very granular, and it should not be a replacement for a true monitoring system. Uh, but you could come in and see uh, a number of um, number of details. We'll take a look. This is an advanced zone uh, and advanced and cloud stack means you're using VLANs. Um, so we can come take a look at the network that's available here. And so we've got a uh, We've got a layer three switch um, that's routing a public network for us, uh, and also providing us with a, uh, a trunk of full of VLANs. And then we also have some network service providers that we can configure. You'll notice that in this one, the only thing that's configured is the virtual router. But we could certainly also turn on some of these other uh, routing devices. Um, we have projects available that will essentially allow you to share resources with another account. Uh, this is typically very useful in, in a private cloud um, where you may have some cross-team collaboration that you want to do. Uh, and this also kind of breaks out billing, making it uh, not just uh, one account specific. So we talked about accounts real briefly, and I'm, uh, I know we're pressed for time, so I will try and hurry and shut up here. Um, but essentially, a, an account will have a number of users, uh, and this one only has one, but you can add multiple users to an account, and an account is considered the lowest uh, denominator that you would charge back or report usage or bill against. Um, so you could have you know, a low-level 
uh, department uh, that would have an account and every user would have um, a user account underneath that. And you can also then nest those into domains which are the equivalent of an Active Directory or LDAP OU. Um, and so uh, let me look real quickly here and see if I can find a um, so you can find uh, you can nest these and accounts would um, uh, live in a domain or subdomain and uh, and of course users underneath that and of course as you can see here you can apply limits uh, to those uh, to those domains pretty easily pretty trivially um, and uh, so CloudSite gives you a ton of capability. Um, I will uh, jump out of the screen here for a moment. Um, I will say that if you're really interested in, in just playing around with CloudStack, um, one of our uh, one of the developers for CloudStack that um, uh, has just uh, put up a virtual machine image that you can run in VirtualBox that will stand up a pretty simple cloud stack environment uh, for you. Um, and uh, that's called DevCloud. If you Google for DevCloud cloud stack, you can certainly find uh, links to that, uh, including all those instructions. And you can have a, uh, after you download the image, uh, you can have something running in, in less than 10 minutes, uh, a working cloud stack instance. So it's, it's quite powerful from that perspective. Um, I'm, here are links uh, for CloudStack. Again, I am uh, David Malley, and I guess, Geraldine, if you want to start tossing quest whatever questions we have time for, I'm happy to entertain those. Great. Thanks, David. Um, so a general question about uh, feature set uh, between um, open source and, and cloud platform. For example, um, one of the um, listeners would like to know, is HA a pay-for feature? So if you could just talk about, you know, perhaps about the difference between the code bases. Yeah, so, so after, uh, after August of last year, the code bases for what is now Citrix Cloud Platform and CloudStack were completely identical. Um, and there is literally no feature difference. There's some branding difference. Uh, Citrix logos were applied to, to Cloud Platform releases. So things like HA have been available um, probably for two years now. Uh, and that works right now. That works across all hypervisors. Uh, maybe in the future that won't be true. But um, uh, so even though Zen has a high availability feature that uh, Zen server that they require you to pay for, uh, you can get high availability for Zen for free by adding CloudStack as the orchestration layer on top of that. Um, the uh, there's also uh, you know, now that we've moved to the Apache Software Foundation. Cloud Platform is truly a different, um, a different set of uh, different product, uh, although it shares again that common code base. Um, my understanding is that the folks uh, in Cloud Platform engineering have essentially made a commitment at an executive level that uh, that they will do all of their development work in CloudStack, and that short of features being rejected. Uh, that there will be no feature difference between what is in Cloud Platform and what is in Cloud Stack. Great, thanks. Um, we have um, a question about a, a new term we think we heard coined today. That is RFM TTR. We know what MTTT, MTTR is, but RF. Can you please clarify? RF is really fast. So, so um, I, I really don't like that. Uh, and and it's it did not start with us. Uh, a lot of other players in the virtualization uh, industry started out calling this high availability, um, where you can essentially take a uh, a virtual machine and and restart it somewhere else. Um, unfortunately, it's not high availability as as most high availability folks would call it. Um, it's oh, we detected that the machine went down and there's nothing providing whatever service is supposed to be highly available, we should restart that. And so, um, so I've coined the phrase really fast mean time to recovery to, to be uh, what that feature really is. Um, I don't think that's, uh, aside from my slides, I don't think that term really exists anywhere else. 
Great, thanks. And David, a quick question about the management server and the MySQL instance behind it. So can the MySQL instance be made highly available or available? So yeah, typically yeah. what will happen is when, when, someone, uh, when someone is deploying this uh, and has a concern for availability, um, they will cluster MySQL. They typically will do that active passive, which means that it requires some interaction uh, to, to move over. Uh, some people will uh, do active passive and also have load balancers in front of it. And uh, there are other more brave souls who are braver than I am um, who are doing active active with MySQL. Um, and uh, so there are certainly some, some uh, ways to get around that. It is important to note though that uh, you know, if a management server or even the database fall over, that what is up and functioning at that time will continue to be up and functioning. It, it's not like the entire cloud fails over or falls over. Um, everything will continue running as it was. You won't obviously be able to provision new services, but uh, but the loss of uh, loss of the head doesn't mean the body dies. Great, thanks. We have two questions come in about clarification um, when you were talking about the security groups. And the, the question is basically, um, layer 3 security, can it only be used if you have a router, meaning you can't use it with a switch? Um, no, so you could, you could certainly uh, use it with a switch. You're obviously going to have to have something that uh, typically you would have a routing device that's going to route you uh, outside of that uh, flat layer 2 network. Um, but uh, you're, you certainly can just have a, uh, a switch. Uh, you, you actually don't even need, uh, you can use pretty commodity switches that don't even support uh, VLANs, uh, although I'm not sure that they would keep up with tremendous load because typically that means they're going to be a, a cheaper switch. But um, you can do that super cheap uh, and, and get, still retain that same level of functionality. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question about Active Directory. How would a company-wide service like the Active Directory work with security groups and network segregation? Um, so typically, uh, you know, you would be using um, you would be using Active Directory only for uh, LDAP, uh, essentially as a, uh, um, authorization. Uh, you wouldn't. I can't imagine. I don't think there's any way to currently do some of the things that um, that uh, some of the Windows services do as far as network isolation via Active Directory or allowing Active Directory to be that gatekeeper. Um, I don't think that there's currently a plug-in for that. I would certainly welcome the, a contribution for that, but um, aside from uh, just integrating with authorization, those wouldn't integrate today. Uh, obviously you would have accounts would be segregated um, via security groups, whether they were uh, whether they're backed by an LDAP store or backed by just the MySQL storage of accounts and passwords. Thanks. Um, a question about uh, DHCP. So, any plans for redundant DHCP service VMs? And then, and as an extension to that, you know, kind of what are the overall plans around, you know, extending um, DHCP and DNS to connect in, in internal instances? Sure. So um, DHCP is currently running on um, the system VM that's called a virtual router. Uh, if you need redundancy there, um, you can you can enable redundant router service so that. Uh, there is uh, there will be two virtual routers running, one of them passive monitoring the other via VRRP, and it would come online if the other became unavailable. Uh, so you can do that to handle availability, um, and uh, um, you know generally speaking, I think. Uh, I think that addresses most of the concerns about availability. Uh, typically, if a machine goes down, um, so so even if you don't have redundant router enabled, um, all the system VMs are considered HA, and they will uh, they will try and respawn themselves either on that host or on another host in the same cluster, um, and that's that's uh, essentially how availability is is dealt with.
Okay, uh, David, um, two more questions. One, one is about the Apache incubator status, and if you want to comment a little bit about, uh, you know, what it means to be a, a, uh, in the incubator and what, what does graduation look like? Sure. So um, CloudStack has uh, essentially a process by uh, which they induct new projects. It, it's not necessarily a reflection on the code status of the project, but more the process status because uh, Apache has um, plenty of process and, uh, and understanding that, understanding how things get done uh, and ensuring that things are done uh, properly uh, from a community perspective is one of the goals of, of the incubator. Um, and so we are, we are currently working through that. Uh, there are also a number of, of issues around uh, things that that CloudStack used to do. For instance, we used to also distribute GPL licensed code alongside our Apache code uh, that are not permitted under the Apache guidelines. So we're either having to rewrite or, or uh, do away with our need for some of that, those pieces of code. Um, and uh, essentially the Apache brand has, um, has a set of expectations that a project will adhere to um, as an Apache project and getting that, uh, uh, getting all of those things in place and ensuring that you're doing things uh, in a way that's acceptable uh, to the larger Apache community uh, is, is part of that incubation process. Um, we are a few months in. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, certainly in the next uh, a month or two or even three, I don't think that we're, we're and this is my personal thing, I don't think we're looking at, at, uh, at graduating uh, in the next two or three months. Uh, we've got a number of things. One of them is simply migration of resources. Um, CloudStack was a pretty substantial project and uh, on its own. And so we have a number of, of uh, resources and, and uh, things that need to get migrated to the Apache Software Foundation, that's still in process. We have a number of, uh, a number of things to do to get ready to release, and typically while a release isn't required, um, it's, it's one of those things that's expected. Uh, so we've got a lot of things that we're doing to, to uh, get ready for releases. And, and we also have some things to do, I think, around uh, proving that we're uh, handling our governance uh, in accordance with the way that Apache uh, expects of that. Um, and, uh, and when moving a, a code base and a project as large as CloudStack into the incubator, I think their expectation is that it's going to take us some time to, to get oriented, get everything moved in, and, uh, and be compliant. And, and once we get those things, I don't think that uh, I don't think graduation will be a big barrier to us, and, and looking forward to doing that. But I, I have no immediate timeline on on when I would even expect that to happen. Uh, I certainly don't expect it in the in the super near term. Thanks, David. And then. Um one question I think that's been on the back of other folks' mind is, can you differentiate between CloudStack and OpenStack? There are some folks out there who are, you know, um, struggling to understand the, these uh, two major open source projects and, and what, the, what the differences are. Sure. So, so there, are some, um, there are some fundamental differences. Uh, CloudStack is written in Java for the most part. Um, OpenStack is largely written in Python. Um, CloudStack predates um, predates OpenStack by about two years as far as development time, um, and, and CloudStack was uh, was had production deployments, um, large production deployments before OpenStack existed as a project. Um, so I would argue that there's a little difference in maturity, although I think. The uh, folks at OpenStack are making great headway, um, and certainly there's a mixture of maturity within OpenStack. So CloudStack focuses on the compute uh, side of things, providing infrastructure as a service, and 
and OpenStack has a little broader vision. Uh, so they're doing things like storage, um, which CloudStack doesn't directly offer. They're doing a number of other things that that um, that have no analog in the CloudStack space, uh, and those are all separate projects, and they have varying levels of of uh, maturity there. So things like Swift are incredibly mature and uh, and have been used in production for years now. Um, and there are other things that, uh, other projects that are far more nascent. Um, there's also, uh, you know, certainly a, a difference in feature set. Um, and uh, that, that certainly changes over time. But uh, the last time I looked, there was no, nothing like high availability. Um, uh, there was nothing like uh, you know, having multiple hypervisors uh, in, uh, in a single cloud uh, that was available in OpenStack, whereas CloudStack uh, uh, has that ability. And I'm sure that there are, uh, there are deficiencies that CloudStack has that, that OpenStack fills. Um, but uh, you know, just a little bit of uh, a little bit of functional uh, difference there. Uh, certainly, some uh, uh, some project differences. Uh, you know, CloudStack has moved to the Apache Software Foundation and used to be under the governance of Citrix. Um, uh, OpenStack uh, is currently under the governance of Rackspace, but rapidly moving to a foundation um, to provide some some more uh, transparent governance. Um, so you know, in many ways, they are they are headed down the same path, and and uh, um, and in many ways, there are, there are plenty of differences there that, that even get down to fundamental uh, language differences. Um, so uh, I'd encourage you know, I think you know, again, personally, I'm I'm obviously biased because I've been working on CloudStack for a while now. Um, but I think CloudStack is the more complete and more mature option. Um, and I encourage folks to to, uh, to try it out. I think there's um, I think there's quite a bit of uh, uh, choice available to you, even past uh, past CloudStack and OpenStack. There are other cloud platforms. Um, some of them have different niches and do certain things that may be important to you better than others. Um, and I think it's a, a pretty heady decision to jump into without investigating your options. Thanks, David. Um, one, one last technical question, because I know it is one that we see a lot on the forums. Is there any method for using local disk on the hypervisors as distributed storage versus having dedicated hardware for primary storage? And if so, where would I find instructions for how to set that up? So there are a number of people who are who are doing that? Um, uh, Seth, uh, the Seth project, who's doing a talk later today, um, has some folks working on making that a first-class citizen in in CloudStack, and you should certainly read the development mailing list. There's there's code in the repo that does that right now. Um, uh, there are a number of folks who are also using Gluster and using the local disks and using that as shared storage, um, uh, and uh, uh, essentially, Gluster does not work out of the box with KVM, and so uh, there are some patches that you have to apply to Gluster um, to get that working. Uh, I would, uh, I would again uh, look on the mailing list, and also uh, uh, there are a number of people who have written up blog posts about using Gluster with CloudStack and the patches they had to to patch Gluster with uh, to make. Cluster and KVM behave appropriately. Um, those are, those, I think, those are the places that I would uh, would seek out first. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank David for his uh, informative deep dive on uh, on CloudStack.